Welcome all together. This is the German Neubaufahrzeug, the number three bis five. There were five of them made back then in 1936, and two of them had a turret designed by Rheinmetall and three designed by Krupp. The chassis was the same all around, so that's why we have a range of vehicle. I did assemble it before I had, so I just because this is a gift by my girlfriend and gifts I built immediately right away and don't go all the way with the weathering, just getting it into a good shelf standard. From the historical perspective, this is a continuation of the Groß Traktor project. And yeah, this multi turret design, we all know this didn't lead anywhere significant. So that was dropped. Three of these vehicles were used during the Unternehmen Weserübung, that was the assault on Norway in early 1940, and all three vehicles were the Krupp turret version. They were used in combat, even though this was more a show of force, but they didn't prevail in any way, shape or form. The armor is just too weak, the vehicle too large, too heavy and everything, the whole tank development, the whole doctrines about them were just in development in its early stages. So they didn't, um, yeah, it didn't pay out using them. Nevertheless, it's an interesting looking vehicle and I quite enjoyed building it or I enjoy having it now as it is. So let's talk a little bit about an after action report or the build process in general. So we get a multimedia kit, we have to assemble a few photo edge parts. They are just bent into shape, go on each of these carriages here. That's nothing too complicated. So if you fear photo edge for any reason, you will be fine on this build. A nice touch is Trumpeter is including brass barrels for this twin gun design. We have one for an anti-tank roll and one the larger caliber for a high explosive shell for the anti-infantry design. The whole assembly was not too great. There are a little bit fit issues. I noticed with the previously built VK3001, Trumpeter has a few problems with tolerances. And that was the same here. Some of the hatches didn't fit too well. And the major issue was the lower and upper hull fitting not together being bent a little bit or twisted from the molding process. So I'd had to fill and sand a lot here, but this is still covered up by the sponsors from, for the running gear assembly. Still, I was in fear something would be visible from the outside, so I fixed it. Some of you will jump at me for not using track pins on this project. The reason are these single link workable tracks by Trumpeter. We get 140 pairs plus double the amount of track pins. And remember my experience with the VK3001H. This does not work at all. Um, Trumpeter has really issues getting the right tolerances. These track links, aside from sanding and clipping off five connection pieces per track link 140 times times two. No, uh, the real problem is the fit issue with the pins and the holes on the track links. This is a slight fit. It should be an interference fit. And the track pins are way too short to keep these single links workable. I had issues now twice with the Trumpeter one, but succeeded in completing the mini art ones and the ones from Bronco. The video on this Bronco Stuck is already online. They worked perfectly. That's just Trumpeter messing up a slide fit instead of using an interference fit, making the studs too short. And to be honest, the Fruil model ones are costing more than the kit itself. So I will have to look into resin printing them when we do, if we do here the number one and two of this Neubaufahrzeug, maybe I have resin tracks or I won't do the vehicle at all. So we will see, time will tell. But now let's get into the painting of the vehicle. Into the painting of this vehicle, of course I spare you the airbrushing part, but let's just 
try and find out what I've done so far. This is Mr. Surfacer 1200. I use it always as a primer, followed up by some generic dark brown, Staubbraun, just using it for the tracks and exhaust. And the main color is XF63 by Tamiya. For all these colors, I use Mr. Hobby Leveling Thinner and I get some good results using it, I have to say. Once the airbrush painting is done, I switch into painting the details. But I'm traveling with some light package. This time I'm at my parents' house making this video, so I don't have the complete selection of paints with me. But this is rubber and tires for the rubber rims of the road wheels. And I use a fairly large cat tongue brush just to get a good coverage. It's all about rotating the workpiece so we can always observe the tip of the brush and then the whole thing is no problem at all. The gun barrels here and the antenna were painted in black. <laughs> I don't have the polished metal with me, but we will fix it in the weathering. Now let's start just getting some interest into the surface and I use a medium gray for it. I would like to highlight or outline inline all the surfaces of this vehicle. While this German Panzer Grey, Dark Grey or RAL 7021 is the most easiest paint to spray on a vehicle, it's one of the hardest paints to make it look interesting. Unless we want to use a color modulation, but a color modulation can look very cartoony, cartoon style, so I'm not a fan of it per se, using it on every project. When used in a resourceful way, edge highlighting adds a lot to a model without going into a full-blown color modulation. But as I said, it has to be done a little bit smarter or it will look Warhammer style, this tabletop miniature style. And I achieve this effect here by just using the brush to blend the oil back into the surface, leaving the most coverage on the edge and then creating a blend into the rest of the surface. This not only claims space, but it makes it a little bit more easy to look at if we don't have this harsh border. But one thing should be clear, I use quality thinner. This is from Ammo by Mick, that's enamel odorless thinner. And in my experience, this is the secret to get a good result using oil paints, using not hardware store quality thinners, but using the ones that are meant for our paints. And the difference is quite visible. Of course, there has to still evaporate some of the thinner, but yeah, I think it's worth the time doing and it doesn't go too slow compared to the color modulation when we would spray with some masks and stencils trying to achieve the same result. Here I show the turret that's yeah done all over the surfaces around the complete model. Yeah, it helps a lot getting a little bit more brightness variation here, color value. That's not changing the hue of the color, it's only changing the value, getting some gradients, making some light effects. Okay, the other thing I did to prepare the surface further was a filter. Usually we are told filters are here for changing the chroma, making a little bit a warmth impression when light hits, sunlight hits the vehicle in the evening or in the morning. But filters can be used in various different ways, of course. And this is a color you would usually get when you're doing a dot filter. Mixing everything together gives a brownish gray in usual cases. So I went for this tan color to get the surface into a shape of a pre pin washed effect. So a little bit a mixture from a streaking or a dot filter and an early pin wash. Using a bright tan or buff style filter helps a lot with getting the impression of this dust deposit effect, this pin wash, even pin wash effect. And of course it helps unifying the edge highlighting together. When blending oils there always will be a little bit a residue looking a little bit funny here and there. The tan filter here helps pulling all the things together. At least I think, in my opinion, it's completely worth doing. This was with the oil applied all over the tank here. This is the first stage of me preparing the surface. 
In the next stage, I would like to add some grime, the first streaking effects, before we even talk about applying the decals. So let's move on. Let's have a look at the color call out by Trumpeter. The first one is with this dark gray and dark brown, a pre-war or early war camouflage, the number eight and subsequently the number 10 on the other side of the sheet are the ones from the Panzer Division zur speziellen Verwendung. That's the one in Norway. And this call out I go for is for post Norway, post combat. They had a very special tradition in these early days of the Panzer Division. The name of fallen comrades or crew members were put on the outside of the tank. In this case, the Unteroffizier Lyrik died in late April during a combat with the Norwegian and English troops, one of the first and last major encounters with these tanks in combat. And yeah, this was just the color or the color call out I went for. It's a little bit different looking from just the gray and brownish look. And we see it's post engagement since the vehicle was most likely gray by then after repairs. In case we see the early Rheinmetall or mild steel Krupp version of this vehicle, I will paint it in gray with brown patches, of course. The decals itself are very nice. They are somewhat thin. I laid them down on a coat of semi gloss. That's the real colors, of course. And after they dried, I sprayed another coat of semi gloss over it just to get the rid of the silvering and I had no issues whatsoever. The markings on this vehicle are very nice, I think. I really like it. it. Just captures a little bit of the early days of the Panzer divisions. But now let's start with the weathering since the decals are on. You see me comparing here engine grime with the base color of the tank. It's very similar, but a little bit more brownish once sprayed on or applied. And it can be used for a very subtle streaking effect. But since it's already Friday and I'm running out of editing time, ah, cliffhanger, <laughs> I'm sorry. We continue the weathering next week. I upload it on the Monday, I think. So you can watch it on Friday, just spending a little bit more time finishing the tracks, for example, with the pins, putting a little bit more work into it. See you then. Happy modeling till next week.